everyone. I'm Nikki Reed, and as I said before, I'm the only one who is not qualified to be here today, but I am, and I'm here on behalf of Harvard Sea Change and the Environmental Media so Association, where I serve on the advisory board. Um, this is part of a series called Real Science Actors Asking Experts, and I will be serving as the actor, not the expert, <laughs> in which we aim to give our viewers the opportunity to hear directly from scientists on important climate, environmental, and public health issues. And today we will be having a wonderful conversation with the incredible Dr. Carmen Messerlian on the impacts of chemicals on pregnancy and children's health and strategies for reducing exposure to improve your health and keep your family safe. So Dr. Mazurlian is Assistant Professor of Environmental Reproductive, Perinatal, and Pediatric Epidemiology, say that four times, at <laughs> Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and she's the director of the newly formed Scientific Early Life Environmental Health and Development Seed Program, say that 10 times, where we will... <laughs> Uh, which we will talk more about in our interview. Um, she is a passionate and curious scientist committed to understanding how the world around us impacts human reproductive health and development. I'm curious as well, so I'm glad we're talking about this. And her research at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health is focused on examining the extent to which preconception and prenatal exposures to endocrine disrupting chemicals love this sentence, affect a couple's ability to conceive, maintain pregnancy, and deliver healthy babies. So clearly, um, there's a lot to cover. And also on this call with us is Sarah Wright Olson, who is my dear friend, but also very much an expert here as well, and appropriately placed. She is an actress, a mama, an entrepreneur, a business owner, co-founder of Bayo, and also co-founder of Yours and Mama, and now author. So I'm, uh, I'm in good company today, and <laughs> I will now just mute myself and let everyone else speak. <laughs> no way, don't do that. <laughs> Welcome, oh. please. Thank you so much for, um, for joining today. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Sky, and others at the Sea Change, and um, in your organization, I'm very pleased to be part of this conversation. Um, is it okay for me to call you Dr. Carmen? Please do not. <laughs> what do you want me to call you? <laughs> Just come I love, I love Oh, great. Okay, wonderful. Um, I'm so excited to be on here with you both. Um, Nikki, I adore you. And you are someone who educates me all the time on amazing um, information about the environment, but also about... Um, you know, things that are in our products. And I feel like I could call you anytime. So you're perfectly placed here. Um, and, uh, and Carmen, I'm so excited to jump into this with you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background and what got you interested in studying the intersection of environment exposures and health? A little bit about my background. Um, so I finished a PhD in epidemiology at McGill University. Um, I guess in 2014. And during the time of my PhD, I was very interested in um, basically infertility. I studied infertility and looked at the causes of infertility. And initially, I really wanted to study um, how environmental factors impacted miscarriage risk. And at the time of my PhD project, um, the study that I wanted to pursue was not um, ripe for analysis yet. And so I jumped on this new um, project with my mentor at the time, Olga Basso. Um, where we looked at, um, I got very involved in an infertility clinic setting, clinical setting, where I did clinical research in that setting. Um, but what really struck me from, from many, many years is how conditions, conditions that we have very little control of in our environment typically um, impact our health um, and impact especially our, our fertility potential um, and our pregnancy and how little we kind of knew about how those environmental factors actually do affect us on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I um, decided to pursue a, P a postdoc at Harvard Chan School of Public Health um, at the time with um, a mentor, Russ Hauser, who ran this large study called the Earth Study, the Environment and Reproductive Health Study, that allowed me to really dive deep into um, 
specific chemicals that are very pervasive in our environment that we that we are exposed to every day, each and every one of us are, and how those chemicals impact um, a woman's chance of getting pregnant, a couple's chance of getting pregnant, the success of that pregnancy, and um, and the health of the pregnancy and the health of the child as it ages and, and matures into a into a child and into an adult. Um, so yeah, so that's sort of um, maybe a long-winded version of why. <laughs> what my background is. But um, yeah, so since then, I've really been fascinated by this field. Um, um, I think there's so much to to learn and to understand. Um, I think that so little is known and so little information is provided to women, women like yourselves and myself as well, and how to empower ourselves to be able to have more control over the things that we're exposed to in our everyday environment and to understand sort of um, how we might be able to modify some of those exposures, how we could change our exposures um, to try to reduce our risk if possible. But to get to that, we need to understand what are the chemicals that affect our reproductive health. Mm. I would love to talk for a second about, well, there's a, just so you know where I'm going <laughs> here with this is um, I do think we should, I definitely wanna cover what those chemicals are. And I also would love to talk to you about what the intersection is between, I mean, obviously you study uh, you know, perinatal and reproductive health as it relates to these chemicals um, and the obstacles that women face trying or families face trying to get pregnant. But also there is a real intersection that I feel I'm sure an overlap that I'm sure really fascinates you too between all of those things and overall health um, in that I think that we're probably exposed to things on a daily basis that are not necessarily in products that we use, although I'm sure they are, but also just in our general environment. And I would love to talk about what those things are because some we can control and then some we can't. And so I think like, let's talk about what we can control and then what we can't control. And then also in a moment, just before I forget, I would love to talk about, as someone who also was on a fertility journey, why we don't talk about these things as it relates to men and only women, because I know that when my when my husband and I were trying to conceive early on, there was never any talk about what could possibly be wrong with uh, male reproductive health and how they play a role in this too. So those are great points for someone who felt that she wasn't available or present for this. <laughs> I told you she was being very modest. Being very modest. Like, those, those are really awesome points that I think um, if we can get into it a little bit. Um, so some of the challenges that I face in my research and things that I'm pursuing in my work, um, really you captured on specifically. So the first one is around you know in terms of empowering women, empowering couples, empowering families. Um, we can get really bogged down into the things that we can't control and that can make us really crazy and stressed out. And, and we shouldn't really focus on those things. We should really try to um, choose products and behaviors and lifestyles that we do have some control over um, and really focus our energy on identifying what those things are, understanding what those things are and trying to make choices that could allow our families to have um, sort of healthier exposures on a day-to-day -day basis. But other things that you can't really mitigate, we shouldn't get too stressed out over, we can't really change. And so those are the things that I really try not to worry about myself as a, as a mom and of, of two children and, um, and, a, and a woman. Um, I try not to get too worried about the things that I don't really have much control over, but where I do have a lot of control over like nutrition and choices around food, for example, I know I could have, you know, I can make a choice around that. And so I try to pick things that I know have a higher nutrient content or a lower pesticide um, um, load. Um, and those kinds of decisions I think are, are helpful to people. But <clears throat> in addition to that, we need to consider, you know, you and I and Nikki, um, hopefully Sky too, she's not a student anymore. Um, we could, you know, we have probably the means to be able to make those kinds of choices, purchase products um, that um, are safer alternatives. Um, but for a large part of the population, that's not possible. And so one of the things I'd like to see is, um, you know, having more equity around those kinds of issues and being able to not make it, you know, not make it, um, um, a marketplace for those that are privileged and educated and white, um, but a marketplace for everyone, that everyone has a right to have a safe um, safe home, a safe um, a safe food source, safe water source, because water is becoming a really big issue. I'm drinking water right now that's been filtered. Um, 
so these kinds of things, I think are, you know, there's like, there's the individual level issue that we're talking about you and me and how we take care of our families. But my work also looks at sort of the group of people, the population and how we can sort of um, change trajectories on a population level. So reducing the exposure across, across, you know, across groups of people so that we can decrease the burden of disease in, in a group of women or a group of mothers or a group of children, a group of fathers. Um, and so that's sort of the public health angle that I really try to take in, in the work that I do also. Um, Does that's your worker field study region and connecting region to like you're saying on a macro level mm -hmm. that you look at the public in general um, in sort of groups and see what their exposure level is or how they're affected. Does your work look at specific regions or do you see a correlation between certain areas and what those chemicals are in those areas? Look, I feel like I'm going very Aaron Brockovich on you. Right okay, now. okay, I'm very Aaron Brockovich. But water is a good question. So water is something that we do see a lot of regional differences on, and we could use the example of the Flint um, uh, crisis that happened a few years back um, regarding the contamination of their water um, with lead. And you know, these things are di different. Diff definitely gradi gradiated by socioeconomic status, regional differences in terms of where your house is located relative to other things, for example, factories and um, industries. Um, and so your water could be affected by what's around your environment. So I live in a nice back, you know, a nice backyard, someone else could have a factory in their backyard. Um, and so, you know, these kinds of issues bother me as a person, um, as, a, as someone who works in public health and epidemiologist to know that there's, um, opportunity to intervene among those people, individuals that are most at risk, and those children are extremely at risk because they have a compounded problem. So they have, you know, fewer opportunities on all fronts from the time they're born onwards. And in fact, um, even from before they were born, they've had um, in their mom's pregnancy or in their grandmother's pregnancy um, risk factors that could play into that child's health. And so those kinds of things are the kinds of questions that. Um, I wouldn't say keep me up at night, but I do work on them very late at night. Um, things that I work on and things that I'm concerned about and that I'd like to see, um, you know, climate change and the issues around that taken more seriously, at least um, in the United States and other countries as well, where we really need to care for all people equally and that each person has a right to safe water, safe environment, clean air, um, and that we shouldn't have gradients of um, of exposure based on SES, although that's a little utopic, a little idealistic, but at the same time, I think those are goals that we should take and, and take seriously in public health. Mm. Yeah. Your other point was about men, and I think that's a really important um, area that we could cover in this conversation because it's an area that I'm pursuing quite, um, quite intently in my research, looking at, so not only males, uh, infertility per se, but exposures in a man. So, okay, I think one of us is pregnant, not me. It's <laughs> one me. Of us <laughs> I do remember before our conversation in the unrecorded phase, um, I was having a glass of wine and you had confessed to a little bit of wine in your pregnancy, potentially, maybe, maybe not. And, um, and we really focus on a woman's exposure and what she does to her body in pregnancy. And I think that is, is a real societal issue is that we're, we're hyper-focused on a woman's body and trying to control what she does and what she doesn't do. Pregnancy becomes an area where people feel they have a right to tell you um, or impose on you a certain level of um, value judgment onto you. Um, but then men have been sort of really, they've escaped that whole, um, that whole sort of scrutiny. Um, and, and it's not because there is no ability to impact a man, not because there's an inability for a man's exposure to impact his health and the health of his offspring. In fact, what we do see is that things that a man's been exposed to, even before he was um, into puberty, when he was um, early on when his gametes were being formed in utero of his mother um, that we saw that we see um, epigenetic effects that could be transmitted through generations into his wow. gametes and into his offspring and so wow. we see this sort of multi-generational effect um, so that's where the, the wow. couple couple generations back women as well but men also so um, but in addition to that what a man does at the time of preconception so when he is 
you know, in the months leading up to conception or the cycle of conception per se, but we know spermatogenesis, so when men make sperm, that takes around 90 days, for example. So in that window, what a man does, for example, drinks alcohol, smokes marijuana, takes drugs, um, exposes himself to air pollution possibly, um, puts products on his body, uses cologne, um, eats food that are, you know, pesticide rich, pesticide um, contaminated foods um, that are possibly also contaminated with other, um, other chemicals um, in the food source like phthalates that we'll get into. Those things can impact the man's ability to conceive a pregnancy. So the conception's affected, but even if the conception is successful to actually maintain a pregnancy, so men's exposure can impact the risk of pregnancy loss. Mm. A man's exposure can impact the weight of a baby. A man's exposure can impact how your baby develops as an infant, the kinds of milestones, you know, the kind of things that we look at from a neurological and neurocognitive, um, neurobehavioral point of view. And so, wow. yes, women have been sort of focused on, but we really have lacked the knowledge, the insight, the impetus to sort of study men. And so that's something that I'm also pursuing because I think we, we have an opportunity to understand more what those risks are, but also intervene. So pregnancy is a couple thing. It's not a woman thing. It takes two to have a baby and there's two periods of exposure in the man and the woman. And it comes together in these gametes, these cells, the egg and the sperm come together and fuse and they're driving that reproductive process, but they bring information into those cells, into the gametes into the embryo and that embryo develops based on information from both those um both those backgrounds the background risk of the man and the woman and so the success of a child's health and and its health as it age as the child grows up develops um, into an adult can be impacted by what the parents did in the pregnancy in the cycle before the pregnancy or during the pregnancy um, but also what happened in your mother's pregnancy and what happened in your grandmother's pregnancy. And so um, that is something that's really a new area of research that uh, we would like to pursue more in my field. And I personally would like to pursue more as well. You know, it's so interesting hearing you talk about that because we, uh, on our um, blog, Yours and Mama, we have a lot of women who write in about fertility issues. Yeah. And, um, and a lot of the times these women, you know, they feel so guilty, like it's their fault. And, you know, there's a lot of emotional um, damage that I think it does on women just feeling like they're carrying the load. Yep. And I do feel like um, for those women hearing your story and what it is that you're researching, I think would be so comforting for them and also empower them to ask more questions and to encourage their partner to be tested alongside of them and just, to, you know, because sometimes people will go a couple of years before they actually are able to see a specialist. Maybe they can't afford to see a specialist, um, but they'll, you know, be trying to get pregnant and working with their doctor, but not understand that this is something that takes two people. It takes a man. Yeah. It takes a man and a woman. And, yeah. and, you know, we're talking about, for, for example, we had someone write in and, and say that, she had been trying to get pregnant for three years and um, they finally went and had her s husband's sperm tested and he had so many sperms that had like double heads and yep. some of them yep. didn't have yep. heads and yep. yeah and it was just it didn't matter what the mother did it wouldn't have mattered how careful she was and she could have been saintly with her exposures and it wouldn't have changed anything because yeah. if you are doing everything right perfectly and your partner sitting there smoking pot, smoking cigarettes, being overweight, not exercising, not, you know, eating a healthy, nutritious diet, that it doesn't matter what you do. There's also the other part that's contributing very deep information beyond just DNA, beyond just, be, sorry, beyond just genetic material. Um, they're contributing epigenetic information. So besides um, the genetic 23 chromosomes, a man contributes an enormous amount of epigenetic data, epigenetic mm. information that's transferred. Can you tell me what that means, epigenetic data. Can you? Okay. So data may not be the right word. So basically in a man's sperm, when he uh, ejaculates, he makes sperm. The sperm carries in, in the head of the sperm, it carries DNA. So it's like the 23 chromo chromosomes sit in the head of the DNA. But in, in addition to that, they have um, microsomal RNAs, um, 
um, mitochondrial RNA and DNA that um, in, information that gets registered through their non-genetic information through different kinds of coding into the um, methylation marks, for example. Um, Ooh, can we talk about that in a second? Don't let me forget. Can we talk about methylation in a second? Okay. Just just wrote that down for you. Because <laughs> you and I have talked about that. A lot. Okay. So is the, would you say it's safe to say the epigenetic, just for like basic terms, yeah. is the coding that maybe is like, let's say, not the secondary coding, but like the less obvious coding that's inside? Is that like a way to... So it's like it's like the it's like the DNA basically has the genetic material in it, but then in addition to that, there's information that sits within um, within those um, parameters that allow the expression of the genetic material, and that expression of that material is can be altered. So it could be hypo or hypermethylated, for example, if we're talking about DNA methylation marks. Um, and that would change and alter the way that genetic expression happens. And so it could overexpress something or underexpress, like for example, a protein. And that can change the way a phenotype is expressed in, in, a, in a pregnancy, for example, in the outcome of that pregnancy, the child. Do we have the capabilities right now to actually test for that pre-conception? No. Definitely. So how do you know that then? Like, how do you, how have you discovered yeah, that? That's a very good question. So we can look at how, um, let's just use DNA methylation as an example, because I think people can maybe understand a little bit better than microRNAs and microsomal RNAs, which are also information that's put into sperm, that is found in sperm that gets transferred into the pregnancy. So for example, um, some of this kind of coding can impact how the embryo is formed and how the, how the placenta is formed very, very early on in a pregnancy. And, and so this information that a man's sperm carries in can drive a certain process in the embryo and then drive a certain process in the placentation of that embryo into the lining of the woman's uterus. And so if you hyper or hypo express a certain genetic marker through these methylation marks, you can have a different um, molecular and um, cellular change into that embryo and into the lining of the uterus and how it kind of embeds and forms a placenta because that information is driven by the by the paternal line um, and so how do we look at this we could look at for example if a man has a higher level of exposure to something like dehp which is the diethyl hexyl phthalate that i've written about in some of my yeah. papers yeah so we could say that men who had the highest level of this particular chemical in their bodies expressed through metabolites in their urine, might have had a hypo or hyper methylation of a certain um, genetic um, expression of a certain gene, for example, or a certain protein that might be necessary for, um, so we look at CPG sites and those CPG sites kind of express a gene or a protein. Um, and so we can see which um, methylation mark CPG site that links up to for a gene. And then we know that that gene is associated with placentation, for example, or embryo development or fetal growth or something else. And so we could look at how those chemicals in a man can change, alter the patterns of expression of the epigenetic through using actual biological material. So we would look at the sperm and look at the urine or look at the blood and look at the sperm and do the epigenetic sort of there's arrays to do this. There's, you know, technology behind doing it, but we can look at that. We've studied, people have studied that. I personally don't look at epigenetic data, but people who do have found that certain chemicals can change the expression of some of these, um, some genes that are very important. One of my colleagues at uh, Uni University of Massachusetts, um, Rick Pilsner has done this work. Um, and he's shown that um, these DHP phthalate, these phthalates, um, diethyl hexyl phthalates specifically impacted um, certain genetic um, markers m measured in epigenetic changes and around, this would, around this embryo would, development, yeah. This would be something that either the man is exposed to or is carrying like be in his lifetime, or you're talking about this is something oh, that- This is specifically around, carried. yeah, so we'll tell you a little bit about, so I'll, let me just give you a little background on like the chemical kind of world, okay? Although the chemical world is vast, I can't cover everything. It's like, it's, there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of chemicals that are, that are manufactured, that are, that are um, synthetic, that we are exposed to in various forms based on 
where we live, what we eat, what we drink, what we put on our bodies, what we breathe. Um, there's different sources of exposure. There's different routes of exposure. So sources could be like, you know, my water is, or my wine is a source in this particular case. So I might drink this and, you know, be exposed to pesticides from the grapes, for example. Hmm. Um, or I might drink this water and I might be exposed to chlorine, for example, through chlorination of water through um, water filtration systems that the city has, which we know some of my recent work shows that chlorination in water can impact um, birth weight and the size of your baby, for example. Um, so those are sources. Food is a source, chemical products are a source. The roots of exposure could be through food, so through your mouth, could be dermal through your skin, could be breathed through the air. Um, these, are the, these are the roots of exposure that we can be in contact with. And all these things change based on what you do every day, right? So it's all behavior driven. And um, again, I caution the behavior part because my behaviors might be impacted by my environment and someone else's is impacted by their environment, but there's so many layers as to why I live here and someone else lives somewhere else. Um, and so I always wanna say that, you know, we're, we, I feel like we're a very privileged kind of group and I, we don't speak for, you know, I don't speak, um, my situation or your situation does not speak for the general population of women out in the United States of America. And I really say that with a lot of um, humanity to what I'm trying to convey, which is we need to be mindful of what we're doing, but we need to always protect the group of people that um, are even more vulnerable than we are in this situation. We have a choice. I can buy organic wine if I want it. This is not organic wine, but I could. Um, but other people can't. And so, yeah, so my point is, so these roots of exposure, so the chemical world, so there's, there's groups or classes of chemicals. There's thousands of different chemicals in the universe of where we live, but we kind of group them into two big kind of bins. The first bin are the ones that we call non-pervasive chemicals, chemicals that are very short-lived. They go in and out of our bodies within hours, minutes, maybe a day. Phthalates are one of these chemicals that we call non-persistent chemicals or short-lived. They last seven to 12 hours. Their half-life is seven to 12 hours. BPA, you've probably heard of, also a very short-lived chemical. Parabens, short-lived chemicals. Um, Triclosan, short-lived chemical. Um, Even if they're short-lived, isn't there something to be said for long-term exposure to short-lived chemicals? I was going to ask oh, that too, good yeah. Point. I must say, that's <laughs> question. Isn't there, yeah. I, I, yeah, so what I was going to say, but um, you very astutely picked up on it, which is chronic daily exposure becomes, you know, becomes yeah. almost long-term. So if I'm drinking the same milk every day and the same cereal every day and the same juice every day. Um, I might have these ex um, exposures that go up and down throughout the day based on what I'm eating, but I'm always eating the same things and I might be in a high exposure level all the time because of the kinds of things that I do every day. And usually diet is something that doesn't change a lot, for example, and diet is a big source of exposure to phthalates like DHP. Um, but you're right, chronic daily exposure, um, even if it's episodic, even if you only eat these things three times a day, could make you um, have kind of a, a baseline that's relatively high over time. So if you average your exposure over 24 hours or a week, you might be in the high level versus someone else who engages in different kinds of patterns of eating might be always at a lower baseline, but they're kind of static over time if you look at an average over a week. So the short-lived ones, we still have to be very, very concerned about because some of these chemicals we know are really reproductive toxic, like they're very toxic to the reproductive system, both male and female. And they also are what we consider epigenetic toxic. So they affect epigenetic markers in egg and sperm, for example, through, um, through these kinds of mechanisms that I mentioned before. We also know that some of these chemicals are, um, are um, obesogenic. So, um, for example, BPA is considered obesogenic. That means that they can drive certain metabolic processes in the direction towards, um, towards increasing your risk for obesity, for example, mm -hmm. uh, or increasing your child's risk for obesity through your exposure in your pregnancy. And so your offspring could then have a higher risk of obesity because of your exposure during, during the period of time when you were pregnant. It depends on the window in pregnancy in which you're exposed. So yeah, very good. So that's the short-lived. The long-term chemicals 
they could stay in our body for a long time. Some of them two years, three years, four years, five years, 10 years. Things like perfluorinated chemicals have very long half-lives. Perfluorinated chemicals are things that we find in stain resistant products, in Teflon products, in um, any anything that's pretty much stain resistant would have a perfluorinated chemical in it. Um, and anything that's coated also has uh, perfluorinated chemicals. But we also know that through different kinds of practices over time that water has been really highly contaminated with perfluorinated chemicals because of um, sites um, in which are, remember I talked about factories, like I could have a big factory somewhere in my backyard, right. Teflon, for example, or 3M, and my water could be taken from a site that comes to my home, but might be processed in an area that has exposure to this factory. And so my water is then contaminated. And, millions of people across the U.S. have water that's contaminated with these chemicals. Um, is it fair to ask you or is it too much work to ask you like after this call as a follow-up if you could just do like a little cheat sheet and give us each like a sheet of paper that says mm -hmm. in your water you should be testing for these 10 things in your beauty products or home products you should be looking yeah. for these 10 things like do you have cheat sheets? Do you have post I have cheat sheets but I can tell you what I do I'll tell you what I do which is gets back to your point at the beginning which was you can't control everything. And I don't make myself, I, I'm very knowledgeable about these things, but I, my stress levels are very low over it personally. I try not to get too worked up over stuff, but I'm very careful with what I put in my home. Like I have zero plastic in my kitchen, zero. I have, I don't use cellophane. I've never used cellophane. I don't use parchment paper. I don't use, I'm very, and I'm not like one of these. What's wrong with parchment paper? <laughs> well, it's it's wet. It's it's got a coating on it that makes it. Um, oh, yeah, it does not pass the no coating test. You're right. Okay. Exactly. So anything that's got a coating. So basically, what you want to think about is nature, and you want to be as close to nature as you possibly can, right? So you want to think about something that's as less, as least processed and least altered as possible to be exposed to on your everyday. So in my kitchen don't use a lot of stuff and I'm not someone who uses like a lot of paper towels um, I just don't consume a lot that's just I was raised in this type of home and I just kind of kept up with it my whole life my mom we never had a single can in our home and she is not an educated person around these matters she just grew up in a country in Greece where everything was sourced from wholesome ingredients and you just don't buy canned stuff um, if she was going to make lentil soup she would you know use dried lentils if she was going to make hummus she would use um, chickpeas that are whole so I've just always had that as a culture a cultural practice so it wasn't that hard for me to adopt and keep that stuff up that said um, you know my milk is in a carton my milk is in a plastic container um, and the reason why that is which I'll get to around these DHP chemicals um, so a lot of the source a lot a lot of the chemicals that i'm concerned about that i've mentioned in my papers that you've meant that you've mentioned before we recorded this conversation are things where our food is contaminated before it even gets to our table so even before i pour it into my glass as the wine was being made or as the olive oil was being produced or as the butter was being manufactured the milk was being processed it has to pass through a series of different types of processing steps and in each and every one of those processing steps there's plastic in some form. Mm -hmm. And those plastics are often what we call plastics that are softened. And, and DHP is a chemical that is used to soften plastic to make things malleable. So tubing, PVC tubing, your wine or your beer or your um, milk or your mm -hmm. olive oil has to go through this tube because it can't be a hard tube. It has to be a very malleable tube. And those malleable tubes are often PVC tubes. And so the DHP does not bind to the plastic per se and so the inside of that pipe that tube it'll leach out some of the DHP and it'll contaminate the milk or the oil or the butter or whatever it is that's being processed into that food product so by the time you get in your class I'm like might as well enjoy it right you might as well not have any guilt about it you can't control how the food is made at all I yeah oh, sorry Sarah you you yeah. no, no 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 I was just I was just gonna say that I just you know it's I, I love hearing you talk about this and I find it so fascinating. Um, when we were writing our book, I remember writing, we wrote a whole chapter on how you should, you know, look for, um, you know, if you can like farmer's market, 
uh, vegetables, organic vegetables. You know, you want to try to avoid chemicals that would be harmful to you during pregnancy. I'm avoiding pesticides. Like, and this got torn apart by um, the publisher, by the lawyer. And, you know, they were just saying, you can't suggest that pesticides are necessarily, and this was published in Australia, so maybe it's just different because it's Australia, but um, that pesticides are so harmful during pregnancy because there hasn't been enough studies. And I was like, there are studies everywhere. I'm literally reading the studies that are saying that this is something that is harmful to you before you're even pregnant. So we're trying to say like, before you decide to conceive, exactly. um, you want to change your diet. You want to change exactly. the things that you're putting on your skin, that you're putting Absolutely. in your body, because Absolutely. this is going to have an effect. And so um, this is a suggestion that we made without, we had to make it, but around, so we couldn't say like, you know, do A, B, C, and D, but try to avoid these things. Yep. Um, but I just, I think it's going to be so great for people to hear you talk about this because um, knowing how many chemicals environmentally there are out there and then also that we're exposed to that we can't control, like what you're saying, that I'm going to buy this organic milk, but it's also been through a plastic pipe. So it's going to have okay. leaching yeah. in it. Totally. Caveat though, the pesticide issue, I really yes. am a firm believer in. And I, yes. I, I'd say like 99% of anything I put in my kitchen, unless there's none and Whole Foods replaces it or something without knowledge is organic because I do yeah. really believe that pesticides are understudied. We do know that they're harmful. We don't, we need more data. We need to understand better how they impact health, reproductive health, children's health and development. But um, we do know that conventional food has a higher load of these chemicals in them, has mm -hmm. pesticides. And so as a way of reducing your exposure, if you can afford it, choosing organic is a very simple strategy that you have control over. But that doesn't mean because you're drinking organic milk that there's not DHP in it. There may not be pesticides or antibiotics. Right, but, but it is a choice that you can make that make, can help. And what we need to think about is like, we're exposed to a soup of chemicals on a day to day. We, 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 and these chemicals are not, not like we study them typically one at a time because that's how we've designed studies and that's the kind of budget we've had. But in reality, in real world scenarios, we're exposed to a complex mixture on a day-to-day -day basis. And that complex mixture includes pesticides, includes phthalates, includes BPA, triclosan, perfluorinated chemicals, um, chlorinated chemicals, um, flame retardants, air pollution that I'm putting into my body that I'm inhaling into my lungs that goes into my bloodstream that affects processes, biological ones. Um, and so this complex mixture is, is, is not studied. We don't know how they kind of interact as, 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 as groups of chemicals in our body. And so I might be low in pesticides um, and high in DHP, but maybe it's the combined effect of high and high that actually causes an outcome that's more adverse. And mm -hmm. so if I can reduce my exposure in things that I can control, like pesticides, I feel like that's something I can control. I have the means to choose organic foods. I choose that because I feel like I'm decreasing my load in an area that I have control over. I can't control if the milk has DHP. I still buy, I buy organic milk, but if it's in glass or plastic, I care a little less about um, because I know that that's already been affected through, you know, the BPA and the DHP and other things have already, you know, it, it, we won't change much by choosing glass versus plastic. Mind you, I prefer glass because the, you know, the recyclability aspect, I think might be maybe the damage to the environment's less, less concerning. You know, there's other reasons possibly, but it's not necessarily because of the chemical being different. Um, so those are kinds of things that you could choose, but what you brought up, which I think is really important, is what you do before you conceive is really important for you and for your partner. And so you could be pure and perfect and your partner could be doing awful things. Well, that's not gonna help you have a healthy pregnancy. You have an impact, but so does he. And so engaging in couple-based behavior change in the preconception period is something that I'm studying and hope to have um, uh, uh, I'm submitting an application for, a, for a, a study to actually look at how we can intervene 
in couples to reduce exposure and to see whether or not it actually does impact their outcome. So we would do a couple-based intervention to get couples to decrease exposure and then see if their time to pregnancy is different or their risk of miscarriage is different or their risk of preterm birth is different, for example. But I really want to, key message is reproduction is a couple-based activity, um, couple-based biological processes, um, and we need to keep in mind that the behavior and the lifestyle factors that go into a baby making process is impacted by what your you and your partner both uh, do and also we didn't get into this but what my mom did and what my grandmother did also impacts my health now and can impact my child's health and my children's children's health down the line which is something that's really kind of hard to grasp but something that we really need to think about when we're conceiving that your baby right now will have a baby and those the, the genetic material for your baby's baby is in you right now mm -hmm. your grandchild's genetic material is in your body presently which is crazy it's right so, so yeah it's you and your husband did or your partner did to conceive that child can impact your grandchild's health um so it's a responsibility that we have towards our our future generation to be mindful of that um and i hope to yeah hope to get more knowledge around how men's health is impacted and how to include men in the dialogue, in the narrative, in the conversation, to be, to understand what they need to know and want to know and how they feel they could change um, their behavior, what kinds of things they would be willing to try to do that could help them um, decrease their overall burden of exposure in their bodies. Well, it starts with knowledge and yeah. education, but it also ultimately ends up in the hands of our ability to test for those things and understand what those environmental factors are through a system of testing that has to be offered and available, which I think we're all uh, globally experiencing the repercussions of not having available testing. Um, but I think it's you know definitely a um, an issue of lack of education and lack of being comfortable within that conversation as well and mm -hmm. then testing and understanding what that is but also i just wanted to bring up because i was having this thought when you were talking yeah. you know the marketplace kind of caters to a type of like gender specific consumption and a mm -hmm. model surrounding that like i think that if we have convinced the women of the world that this is their fault we can also create products and um you know monetize on that insecurity and shame culture that we've created whereas with men i see mm. an issue surrounding the monetization of that because i can see the marketplace going like mm, i don't know if we're going to create a tremendous amount of product and then, you know, revenue based on like, I don't know if men are going to go out and start spending on all the things to fix and tweak their bodies in the way that women are. And I think that that's like a real thing we should be talking about is that we capitalize on that shame culture. Yeah, yeah. very true. Very, very astute observation, I must say, Nikki, <laughs> again. <laughs> um, <laughs> that is really neat. So yeah, no, you're right. There is a market and there is a, I mean, I think that's part, part of the, um, broader reason kind of factors, socio-political, cultural, economic factors that have driven the market around women's bodies being so obsessed upon and hyper-focused upon and pregnancy just magnifies that. Now it's like you and your baby and how dare you harm the unborn. Um, and, um, and women do feel a sensitivity to that. Um, the shaming of women for causing autism or for causing um developmental delays of some type or making your baby be born too early or whatever it happens to be is always put back on the mom to feel like she screwed something up what did i do did i drink too much did i eat too much did i um not exercise did i smoke was it my you know was it what i did when i was a teenager um was it the you know the abortion that i had when i was 15. um and so we have this guilt and shame that um i think is something that's been exploited by industry to be able to sell and to create an, mm -hmm. an image of a woman that should be pure and, and perfect during pregnancy, which is just 
uh, a burden that women carry that I think is very unfair. And one that I do think you're right, that men will not share in that and the marketplace will not find a spot where men will, I'm not sure, some very clever marketing people might be able to figure out a way of getting in there, but if it's tied into some sort of machoism, possibly. Oh, one thing that I do think is an interesting factor is, is this idea that these chemicals impact testosterone. Mm. So I think that's something. So this idea of like um, um, men's testosterone levels going down and sperm quality going down and um, this um, repressed androgen system that might be associated with these chemicals, I think is something that could be um, could be possibly exploited in the in the service of benefiting our health and our children, our pregnancies. Because if men think that um, you're not as sexy and not as appealing if your testosterone levels are lower and you're not uh, as sexually, uh, um, well, capable maybe is the right word. <laughs> if your testosterone's lower. Um, that might be something. And we do know that these chemicals can impact testosterone, can impact testicular function, um, and can have uh, an effect on um, a man's levels of, of testosterone in his body. Yeah. Can I, oh, yeah. No, I was, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go, go, go. <laughs> um, I was just going to say that um, when it, it's going back to when you were talking about. Um, pregnancy loss and, mm. um, you know, your, what women sort of carry after that and how that sort of put on them. Like, what did you do during your pregnancy? Or, you know, if a woman has an autistic child, it's yeah. like, okay, well, let's look at what it was that you were exposed to yeah. or, what did you, you do know, wrong? what did you now, do now, wrong? I'm last and, one you had at 35 weeks. Yes, exactly. Yes. And, you know, it's interesting. And Nikki and I have talked about this, but um, I have an amazing OBGYN who I love. And I had a pregnancy loss last year. And it was interesting because the moment he told me um, that the baby didn't make it, that there was no heartbeat, he yeah. immediately looked at me and said, the first thing I want to tell you is that you did nothing wrong. And my, you know, he was like, you're not going to hear anything that I'm saying after this, but I want you to know that you did nothing wrong. And my ears were sort of ringing and I was looking at him and I was like, of course I did nothing wrong. But, 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 but also I was, I was, you know, afterwards I've thought about that so many times is how grateful I was to have this loving doctor who knew that at some point I would start to question myself and at some point I would go, what is it that I did? Is it because I didn't know I was pregnant until six weeks and maybe I had a glass of wine or, you know, the, the thing that we, that we do. So, um, Absolutely. so yeah. I do, but it might've just as equally have been something your husband or partner would have done exactly, exactly. Have done before, or maybe typically it's usually related to some sort of genetic issue that had nothing to do with you just what egg happened to ovulate in that cycle exactly. um that wasn't you know didn't have the right number of chromosomes that could have impacted but that said there are studies including some of my own that do show an impact with some of these chemicals in relation to very early pregnancy loss um and also clinical pregnancy loss of what we call biochemical pregnancy losses, which are losses that don't have a fetal heartbeat, but were detected um, through uh, a urine test or a blood test. But, mm. um, but those very early losses are, can have a huge impact on a woman's emotional, psychological, physical health even, because the investment um, energy-wise energy into a pregnancy, even up until five or six weeks, is, is quite a bit. And um, having having being someone who's had ha, had a lot of morning sickness in my pregnancies um and i've been lucky to have more pregnancies than i've wanted in my life but um <laughs> but um but that said um those pregnancies all have been you know very early on extraordinary amounts of of um morning sickness um that takes a lot of energy to cope with um and the biological energy that gets driven even up until so people say oh, it was only a little tiny pregnancy it wasn't there was no heartbeat but there was a lot of investment to your your body invested a lot into that little formed embryo um and um and the hormonal changes are there and everything is still there just because there's no heartbeat doesn't mean that it's not 
not um, an entity that's had an impact on your body and your mind and your spirit. And so to minimize it at that stage, I think is, is not helpful, but also to understand why those early pregnancies don't work out. And is it, does it have something to do with what we were exposed to and when were we exposed to those? Mm -hmm. And so some of the work that I've shown is, is really, it's, it's in that really early phase. So it's actually in the periconception window that some of these exposures might impact from the woman's point of view. Now, I'm not talking about the men's point of view, from the woman's point of view, that sometimes you might have a certain exposure in that first couple of weeks around the time of ovulation, around the time of implantation, um, fertilization implantation that could impact the success of the pregnancy. And it could be the man's exposure or the woman's exposure. My studies have focused in this particular case on women, but some of my upcoming studies are focusing on exposures, similar exposure, but in men, to try to discern um, um, why and when, because the when is really relevant because it can help us understand when do I have to change my behavior? So if I'm really careful in that cycle, is that enough to decrease my risk? Or do I have to be careful for three months or six months or nine months? In the case of DEHP, at least based on the one study that I did, which was a small study, that it was really in the cycle of conception that we saw an increased risk for biochemical and clinical pregnancy loss, as well as things like preterm birth. It was in that cycle. So it has something to do with the condition of the uterus or or um, how the egg um, gets released into, um, into the fallopian tubes and how it gets released and what kinds of kind of potential um, changes, in, hormonal change could happen in that state um, that could maybe together impact how that embryo forms and how it implants into the uterus. Um, and it could be based on inflammation. We don't know what the mechanism is, um, but, um, but it helps us if we know the when, we can learn and empower women to say, if you're careful in that cycle, you might increase your chances of a successful pregnancy, and you don't have to worry about what happened last month or the month before. On the other hand, for men, because we know men's uh, sperm takes three months or so to, to make, um, that it might be that his behavior and his lifestyle is really, uh, we need to be mindful of his kind of exposures in a three-month window instead of in the cycle of conception that might be important. So timing is really important and uh, duration of exposure is really important and, and level of exposure is really important. These are the factors that we study. So timing, duration, amount of exposure are all factors and the person's own biology. Um, are, these are all the factors that sort of come together because it's not just one thing, it's a com combination of, of, of factors that come together to determine a risk in an individual person or in a group of people. Do you know what's so interesting? I'm sitting here, I haven't yet spoken about this, um, not for any reason other than, uh, you know, I hold it close to me and um, maybe I wasn't ready or maybe now's the right time, but I also had a pregnancy loss last year. And um, I found out I was pregnant actually when Sarah and I were together. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how close we are. But as I listen to you talk, I'm realizing oh. as educated as I feel I am on this topic, and by that I mean obviously only relatively, but still very familiar with it. I'm realizing as I replay this in my head, which is why I've been sitting here quiet too, that never once did it dawn on me that it had anything to do with anything except me and I didn't even know that I had put that on myself until you were talking I just remember when I found out that the baby didn't make it and when I was going through that, that I, I kept going oh maybe it's because when we were all together last summer Sarah and Eric and her family and I and our, my family I was like maybe it's because I w we were waking up and doing like sprints in the morning or maybe it's because we were drinking all this wine because I had no idea that I was pregnant and I, I did until I guess maybe until now, I actually did only replay things that I had potentially done wrong. So I think it's interesting. Yes, it, it's, it, yes because it's, it's, it's a, it becomes who we identify with. It's that we, as women, I think, take on all of the reproductive health burden, um, all of the burden for our children, their health, their well-being, their mental health, their physical health, their spiritual health, their emotional health. That it, it's it's all become the, the domain of women and the responsibility of women, the burden of women, the, the, um, 
what is called the 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 the, the work the bird the work that's that's unaccounted for that comes and takes up a big part of your brain right it's like it, it inhabits a lot of us and so yeah it's very hard to question because you just assume naturally that it's you and nobody else that was involved in making that baby um can we ask you a, a question about you know we've talked a lot about the things that do for, for most people, myself included, feel um, kind of difficult to digest, right? Like a lot of chemicals and names that we're not necessarily accustomed to hearing or saying. Um, we don't even know how to find them. And then we're talking about like not freaking out over what we can or can't control. But yet so much of this does feel out of our control aside from the topic of organic you know, choosing organic food and avoiding pesticides, which is a great um, semi-easy route. But I just wanted to talk about factors that we actually control that I think no one is really talking about. Not that a lot of people are talking about like PVC and like DHP, but I think one thing that no one is talking about, which we should, is what do you feel or have you studied the effects of uh, I have a few things written down here. Number one, radiation from cell phones and 5G. Whoa, like to talk about that affecting or disrupting our endocrine system. Like I think this is where all of our money should be going. We should be researching this heavily. Um, and, and that'll be a topic in and of itself. Yep. Number two, our own personal body chemicals, like stress releases chemicals in our body. So yeah. let's like go internal for a second too, because yeah. that's something we can kind of control-ish. Again, yeah. debatable. Yeah. Um, and then cell phone towers, which I know is connected to radiation and 5G, but I just want to talk about that. And then also airplane travel, because I'm, you know, my partner travels. Yeah. I don't travel so much anymore. I made a conscious choice not to. And my partner travels sometimes three, four, five days a week. Sometimes he's on five airplanes in a week and I've always thought about you know what that does to reproductive health yeah. too yeah. Uh, even during COVID traveling on a plane no 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 no, no, no. <laughs> COVID, I just no. for yeah. his job in life baby yeah um, possibly lots of time around um, um okay so our, I think let's start with stress because I think that's something that all all women face on some level, I think, um, especially if you're a mom with young children and you're tired and fatigued and stressed and try to manage your career. Um, I think stress is a very much an understudied determinant of reproductive success. Um, I think that it probably does have a big impact and we just don't know how or why. And I do think, and some of the recent studies have shown that it's kind of like a double whammy in some ways that you have like, if you have a high load of these chemicals and you have stress mm -hmm. that together they kind of interact that doesn't, it's not just, it, it's the effect is more than just the parts together, right? So it's like the combination of the two interact to increase risk even more so than if you had any one of these things independently. And so Again, here we go with trying to feel so responsive. Now I've got to control my stress and that's too much for me to manage. We can't do everything. We just can't. Um, I think women are unbelievable and powerful and divine. And we just, I think it's, it's a shame for us to feel that we have so much to carry. And I, I'm very mindful of that um, as a woman. Um, and I think we need to really be kind to ourselves forgiving of ourselves, allowing ourselves the space to screw up, be a terrible mother, be a terrible wife, be a terrible colleague, whatever it is that we can't always reflect negatively on ourselves and evaluate ourselves in a negative light. And I think that takes mindfulness and practice and meditation and thoughtfulness because we are going to be exposed to stress. It's, it's, I mean, at least the three of us, I'm sure, are going to be career women with children trying to balance it all out. It's, it's a daily, minute by minute struggle, struggle every day, right? It's like you're trying to keep the balls up in the air and it's hard to keep them up. Um, I think we need to, on a big macro level, culture needs to change, society needs to change. That's going to be really hard, um, really, really hard, especially in the United States. We don't have childcare available. Women don't have maternity leaves. We don't have sick leaves. We don't have paid parental leave. Um, we don't. Many of us don't even have Medicare or healthcare. So I think from a macro level, that's a big 
hard piece to take on. But on a micro level, on your individual self level, that every one of us, even with no means, can spend time every day and just, even if it's for 20 minutes, shut down everything, all phones, all digital things, all content, get rid of your partner, because that's a big source of stress for most men, most women, <laughs> get him out of the scene, or she, um, and spend time on your own trying to bring your baseline down. And that, you know, I'm probably talking from a very privileged point of view here, but just try to bring yourself back to the roots of where you are as a person, as a human and connect with that energy. I personally spend a lot of time in my garden and I spend a lot of time in trees and in the woods where I get to be on the ground. And I sit literally all year long, even in the winter in Boston, on the ground, in the leaves or in the snow to ground myself. Because it sounds a little hokey pokey, but really it does ground you and it decreases your stress because you have constant constant stimuli. Our children, ourselves, we are under constant stimulation from you know our phones to our careers to interfacing with people. It's too much and we really need to take the plug off and and release ourselves from everything. And the only way you could do that is by just I'm cutting everything off, everyone and everything off, going if you can, find nature, even a bench in a park, even if you don't have woods around you. Bench in a park, sit quiet, still, be still and find yourself and don't move. That is a way of releasing some stress. And I think studying that, maybe went off too much on that because I'm a really big believer on it, but studying- Don't they call that yeah. for, forest bathing? Forest bathing, yeah. I didn't know it was forest bathing. But, <laughs> so like my, I've been doing this for decades, actually since I was like five like a child, I've been forest bathing. And someone's like, you just forest bathe. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> it sounds familiar. It's a, t it's a term they had to come up with to get people to do it. <laughs> but, but forest bathing or any kind of strategy, and I think that's available to all women, all people, um, regardless of your SES, your socioeconomic level and status, you can find a bench. And the point that I'm trying to make is contact with nature, contact with green space, contact with the outdoors can really reduce stress. And we don't know, and I'd love to be able to study this, the impact of doing so on our reproductive health, because I'm certain, I'm certain it impacts our reproductive health, our cycle length, mm. our menstrual cycle characteristics, when we ovulate, how we ovulate, um, our drive for, um, for sexual activity, our sex drives, everything is affected by exposure to a baseline that's down here, because the whole, not to get technical, but the whole HPA axis, which is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which drives our hormonal process, our cycle, our egg release, the quality of the uterine lining, our interest in sex, all driven by how that HPA axis operates and stress affects that HPA axis. It's a stress responding um, access from the pituitary to the adrenal glands, to the endocrine system, through the endocrine system, into the ovaries, into, um, in for, man, for men differently. But um, so yeah, so stress, I think, is an important factor and the combination of the environment plus stress and exposure to greenness and, and healthy activities like mindfulness, meditation, things like that, and those kinds of activities and how they, what you say is the cross section between um, environment, stress, and, uh, and reproductive health, I think is something that is really unstudied, something that I would like to pursue myself and we need to learn more. And to piggyback on that, because one thing that does not go yeah. well with forest bathing is yeah. Instagramming and cell phone use. So <laughs> uh, can we talk- Don't do it. <laughs> Can we talk about um, cell phone usage? And I'll just share a couple of things that I do, and you can tell me if it if you think this makes a difference or if there are any studies on this. But one thing, for example, is I have the Bluetooth turned off on all devices at all times because I literally feel like there are like waves shooting through me. And I also think, why is no one talking about the fact that we all drive these cars now? So we live in these little like bubbles on the road, obviously, again, pre-COVID, but... Uh, 
and we're just shooting Bluetooth through all cars that were made, you know, post the Bluetooth invention. We're driving in these like little microwaves all day long. Yeah. So very good, very um, nice observation because um, in fact, these are things that we don't know a lot about, but we do know that there is a potential for them to impact reproductive health mental health, physical health, all health, but we're focusing a little bit more on reproductive health in this conversation. Um, but um, we just know so little about it, so little about it. We need, we need much better data, well-conducted studies with possibly what I would think is sort of interventions where a group of people don't do it and a group of people do do it and try to follow them up to see if there are differences in um in in groups of people that are and aren't exposed um or exposed less because you may not be able to eliminate it completely but people who are more mindful like yourself turning things off being careful with um my kids confession of a mother in covid my kids have lots of digital devices in the room they have um well they have their uh, mostly their iPhones and they each have laptops and they have to unplug everything out of the wall before bed, everything. There's nothing electrical going on in the rooms at bed, after they go to bed or around bedtime. They have to, and, and is there evidence for that? No. Will there be evidence of it? Maybe. Is there an association? I have no idea, but I have an intuition that I don't want all these EMF frequencies going, like electromagnetic frequencies, going through their rooms and radiation and 5G going through their rooms while they sleep for eight, nine, 10 hours a day. So they know they have to unplug everything out of their walls and turn everything off. Um, and I turn off um, the Wi-Fi at night. Before oh, you do? That's one thing I want to talk about turning. <laughs> off. I told you there's things you can control and there's things you can't. I focus on the things I can. I, I can turn off the Wi-Fi. Very few people turn off Wi-Fi at night, and it's something that I'm trying to figure out how I can study further, just because, you know, you were talking in the beginning about just your basic intuition, like your mother didn't want to eat things out of cans if she could help it, and basic intuition, whether there are studies or no studies, I think if we take a step back and look at this from a bird's eye perspective, now more than ever, we are having stress problems, health problems, and reproductive issues on both men and women's sides, even though men are not being studied as frequently. But I think the signs are all pointing in whatever we're doing in modern day society, whether that's just a symptom of being overworked and overstressed. Maybe if we want to make any kind of basic digital connection right now without having the proof or the studies to back it up, we can at least say this digital life that we're all living is clearly bringing our work home with us and making everybody more stressed. So we can, at a bare minimum, we can rest there. But I think that there's definitely something we have to say for like, Sure, the funding maybe has not supported all these case yeah. studies on this, yeah. but yeah. there's something wrong right now with the direction that we're going. And I would love to bring it back to where you were a minute ago with connecting back to nature, because I think the things that don't exist in nature that like are literally oil and water to nature are phones, stress, yeah. overworked, over chemicaled because if we're living in nature we're living in a more sort of bare simple basic yep. way and connecting yep. to a slowdown and i think yep. if anything that might be like the least um financially yep. beneficial to the marketplace but yep. easiest route for everybody to take for yep. this path towards health and wellness and holistic living agreed 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 i can't say i can't say enough about this that i really truly believe that going back to nature, going back to intuition, going back to our roots, grounding ourselves, is a cheap, easy intervention that could actually impact our cycles, could actually impact our ability to conceive, could actually impact how we operate in our work, how we concentrate on our, you know, I spend a lot of time on the laptop. I work very long hours. I work pretty much every night till very late. <laughs> But I take a lot of time in the day, even if it's in the middle of a work day, three, usually 3 p.m. to 5 p.m., I'll take two hours a day and I'll go outside and I'll do something that's not in front of a screen and typically in the woods with trees and leaves and birds and bees and 
insects and whatever else is out there. And I think it's, it's such a simplified measure that might have a huge impact we don't know what that impact is and I don't need to wait for it because I know it helps me. I know it makes me feel better. I know it makes me better able to concentrate on my work, be a better mom, connect better with myself, feel myself, feel my energy. Um, and I think really it's not too freaky for you guys, but like really you can bring yourself to a place if you meditate that can really reduce or change how your body responds to things. I think we have a lot of power in our minds to control a lot of what goes on in our bodies. That's my belief. Even if I'm an epidemiologist, I feel like the power of the mind and the connection of the spirit can really impact how we cope with stress and exposures and how we interface with the world. Um, trying to find that, anybody can do it. It takes well, maybe that's selfish for me to say anybody can do it because women that are on the front lines right now may not be able to be doing it, may not be able to do it. But when you can, if you can, even for a few minutes a day, 20 minutes a day, can change your health. And I think we don't give enough value because it doesn't have any market value, which is what you're saying. It has no market value. So no one wants to sell it to us, essentially. Um, we have to sell it to ourselves. And we need to share that wisdom amongst ourselves as women as to how... Um, you know, the, the impact of those small measures on our health, I think are um, unappreciated. And, um, and I think intuitively and from personal experience, huge benefits um, with coping with very hard, difficult stress by doing things like that. I think, um, and I think it does impact our reproductive health. Cycle length can be impacted by this. I know for a fact. Um, nutrition, something we spoke about a little bit, but I think another one that we need to emphasize in this conversation is what we put in our bodies, what we put on our bodies. I mean, I do wear makeup. So remember I said, I'm not perfect. I'm like, I'm winging it. I love makeup. You know, I don't wear makeup during COVID, but if I'm on a screen with beautiful <laughs> women, I'm going to put on some makeup. And I, you know, I buy Chanel makeup, right? It's not super clean makeup, right? <laughs> now I just gave Chanel a little endorsement. But I, you know, <laughs> I, I buy stuff that's not super good because it works well, right? It sticks better or it, it makes you feel good because it has a nice little, you know, package on it. Um, you know, so that said, I think I do that. But at the same time, you know, I had, I had like for lunch, I had beets. I eat beets like three, four times a week. Um, I had a big salad. Um, I'm gonna have fish and a huge kale salad tonight with hummus that I'm gonna make myself. And this sounds like it's fancy and hard to do, but it's not. It takes, it doesn't take that much time to make good food. Um, yes, you have to have the means to buy fish and to buy kale and to buy beets. Um, but nutrition, I think, is something we have a huge ability to control and that I think has a very big impact on even mitigating for example, air pollution or phthalates or flame retardants, mitigating the effect of those chemicals in our body because they're antioxidants and they're, they've got a lot of micronutrients that our bodies need to fight some of this toxic stuff like stress and chemicals and other stuff. Um, and Sarah, I think you brought up the pesticide question with some of your, um, some of your, the women that were on um, your blog regarding pregnancy loss. And I think, well, I think the pesticide thing is an issue that we have to be careful about. And I think we don't, we know, like you said, there's plenty of studies that show there's effects and we can impact our health by eating well. Um, and number one rule, don't eat processed stuff. Right. Try to reduce, pro I ate chips though, okay? Confession. I ate beans, but I ate chips. <laughs> I, I also <laughs> eat okay. chips and I love I, chips. I, love I find... Chips. I like to say that chips are a, one of my favorite food groups. Me too. Um, <laughs> me too. Potato, potato, potato. I love, um, I love but, chocolate. I love ice cream. I indulge yeah. in all kinds of junky stuff. Yeah. Like, like we're having ice cream. We're having, like, we're having coffee ice cream. We're going to order delivery through DoorDash. Three pints of ice cream. I'm going to have the coffee one. It's going to be all mine. I'm going to finish most of it tonight. And that's okay. It's in a container that's probably got PFs, you know, 
fluorinated chemicals because it's coated, but I'm going to eat it. I'm going to enjoy it, but I ate beets, so it's okay. Um, and I don't mean that in a facetious way. I mean that in truthful, that your nutrition, your energy in the environment, being outside, getting in contact with nature, grounding yourself are all things we have control over in some ways. Um, and we should leverage to our advantage as women. Um, yeah. You know, Nikki and I have been reading this book, um, Untamed by Glennon Doyle. And yes, uh, we have. I love this book so much, but I love that she is so open about um, how hard it was for her to start meditating. And she talks about how she went into her closet for 10 minutes a day. And so she would sit on the floor in her closet for 10 minutes. And, you know, when she first started doing it, it was like she would be making lists in her head or like, you know, she would be thinking about anything other than what, you know, you're supposed to do when you're meditating, right? Which is, by the way, ex True. exactly yeah. how, yeah, it's exactly yeah. how it's gone down for me. Yeah. Um, but then she said at some point, her body started dropping into this place called the knowing, right? And I loved yes. hearing her talk about that because even when you're outside or you're grounding or you're forest bathing or, you know, for me, it's like being in the mountains or being in the ocean. Like yeah. if I'm there, that's, that's a place where my body feels the most grounded and where yeah. you know, my stress is released and where I feel like I'm in my knowing. It's like, I can really trust my yeah. instincts and that's where it is. Exactly my head is going. And so I love that description because, you know, even sitting down in your closet for 10 minutes a day, if you just allow yourself the time to have that breath, we, then you, you, you that can it. be helpful. Yeah. Another thing we didn't talk about, which I think relates to that is like this idea that women are selfish when they take the time, right? Like you're being selfish. You're taking 10 minutes away from your child's attention. Your child's mm -hmm. I've got a Four, almost 14 year old and almost 11 year old. And you know what? They were fine with being left at times or being, you know, going on an iPhone or going on an iPad, um, even for hours during COVID. Um, they're going to be okay. You don't have that wisdom or that deep knowing when you're a young mom because you don't trust your instincts and your knowingness as well as you should. And I definitely was a mom that did worry about these things when they were little, but. I think the most important um, part of, of growing up a child relates to the energy and the, the, the love that you give to your child and the, the, the spirit that you give. And so even if you, it's like same thing, it's like there's a buffer, you know, they're exposed to crap, screens, technology, other children, other exposures to chemicals that you have no control over, like your sofa that might have flame retardants on it. But there's a buffer that you instill in them, that you give to them. And that's something that is there from you, that you give, that is priceless and also costs nothing. Um, and helping your child develop that buffer from birth onwards, I think is something that everybody can do. And the point to this was back to the selfishness thing that you could take 10 minutes and say, I need 10 minutes. You need to respect mommy's time right now, or if it's your partner, I need 20 minutes or an hour to go out to do X, Y, or Z. Um, and um, and that women often feel that they're being selfish or feeling they're not being a good mom when they do that. I think you're being a very good mom and very good to yourself, and you need to take care of the cells in your body. I use this expression, which is not my own, but your body is the garden of your soul. Your body is the garden that you need to take care of and you need to nurture that garden by, by giving it good energy, good light, good food, grounding it. It's a garden, you need to nourish that garden. And if you're not nourishing it, then it, you're, and I say this to my kids, I've been saying it to them since they are little, tiny kids. Um, you need to look after your body. And this is messaging you give to your children as you have little ones yourselves. Um, you need to protect your body. And I teach my kids about, I've been teaching them about nutrition since birth. Your body is your garden of your soul. You need to protect that body. You have this one body. You need to respect it and love it and care for it. And we give our body good food and that good food helps us. And I tell my kids now, I'm like, you want to play on your computers? No problem. You better eat your vegetables because <laughs> it provides a buffer to the, to the 5G, for example. 
possibly because it's anti there's antioxidants and we know that there's oxidative stress in our cells when we expose ourselves to things like radiation and things like chemicals and so it does actually provide cellular buffer for real and I, you know now they're older so i explain this to them but um yeah i think messaging Connecting and know the knowing part that you brought up, I think is something that I, I think we need to have a book. Maybe you ladies should write it. A book about just connecting to ourselves and to nature and to the, another piece we didn't get to, but very important that I wanted to talk about. The wisdom and the, and, and the, and the data essentially that's given to us from our ancestors, truthfully, there's mm -hmm. data and information transmitted through generations that's bought into our bodies that provide us wisdom and knowing, a knowingness about what's good and what's bad that we have erased over time in our society mm -hmm. because we're exposed mm -hmm. to crap that just drowns our judgment, drowns our instincts, drowns our connection with that energy within ourselves. It's also convenience too, right? Like, I mean, yeah. just going back to what it is that your mother was doing and yeah. what it is that you set up in your kitchen, it's yeah. like, you know, if it's easier to and cheaper to have um, plastics in your kitchen sometimes. Yeah. It's easier to reach for a paper towel than it is to wash your you know, like five towels maybe that you have or, <laughs> yeah. but there's a lot of convenience that's come yeah. into play over the years. But actually, if you bring it down to a very simplistic way of yeah. living, then yeah. you're not only, you're not harming yourself, but also it's environmentally cleaner in general. You're yeah. not harming the environment. Yeah, your impact and your footprint is less. And I think back to the kitchen, back to your home, back to your children, simplified, simple less is more idea this idea that having less is actually having more having less stuff we don't need stuff to be happy you can have the biggest best house on the block and you're going to have the same problems as you have when you have nothing you know that that our happiness and our joy and our contentment has nothing to do with the possessions that we have in fact they clutter our judgment clutter our mind clutter our instinct and our intuition um and so in the kitchen simple simple foods simple diet, simple, you know, even your setup, keep things easy. Um, and don't feel that you need to have this. I mean, I'm someone who doesn't have a lot of social media content. In fact, I have a big confession. My sister's like, don't tell, don't tell the, the ladies you're talking to that you, I have no TV. I don't have television. I've not had television in decades. Um, I've, you okay. know, I looked you ladies up, I promise. <laughs> no, no I, I love that. Yeah, I yeah. think that's great. I, mean, I have no contact with this, like with so with with popular culture. Zero contact with popular culture. Z I don't have an inst I do have an Instagram account that I create, but I have no idea what the password is. The <laughs> Don't know what password is. My kids it's like, it keeps loser. you present. It keeps you exactly yeah. where you need to be. Exactly. It keeps you present. Yeah, you and I don't be anywhere yeah. else. And I don't watch television because I feel not that I don't appreciate it. And I love the pursuit of arts and the pursuit of, of creativity that's expressed through a different form. So you use acting to express your creativity. I use science to express my creativity. And we all have our way of expressing ourselves creatively. And, um, but for me, that changes the way I interface with the world because I feel like it affects who I am and how I see myself. So. Um, it impacts how I feel about my body or how I feel about my children or how I feel about my partner or my home or what I have and what I don't have. And so I don't want that filter. I want the filter that I know that's true to me. Um, so I choose not to do that. And it's an exposure that I choose to avoid. But you could choose something else that you choose to avoid. That might be pr You might go to church, for example, and that might be a, an exposure that you inherit and, and embody, that you practice um, going to church once a week physically before COVID. Um, and that might be an exposure that grounds you and brings you safety and brings you strength and the knowing, which I think is a nice word. Um, because we all know so much more than we give ourselves credit for. And that knowing is given to us, not just through our own bodies, but through generations that have been passed through us. I believe that and I feel it. I feel my grandmother. I feel my great grandmother. I've not met her or known her, but you have an energy there that you feel you're responsible for that you need to transmit um, and you try to give that to your family and to your children and i think it does provide a buffer to 
five G's and air pollution and you know the chemicals. Um, if it's real and if it's evidence based, I don't know. I would like to know at some point in my career. Um, but I think they are important and ones that I think the future should um, be focused on. I think the post COVID era will really allow and force us to actually entertain this idea that less is more, that being indoors is not where we're meant to be. Um, and that embracing nature and, and, and things that help us connect to the energy that's out there that we don't know or haven't experienced will be, I think, part of the post COVID phase of our lives. And I hope that, I hope that the marketplace embraces it and tries to sell it to us so that we can know that it, it has some <laughs> longevity because without, without the marketplace getting for, involved, I don't think the longevity of these things will, will be there, um, unfortunately. <laughs> Beautifully yeah. said, beautifully yeah. said. And thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. We could talk to you for hours. <laughs> and I have a little one who I can hear on the monitor is waking up. So <laughs> I, need to go, I need to get her. Listen, I have no problem taking 10 minutes for myself. Now it's been in like a little longer than 10 minutes. And now I know it's my, I'm wow. getting her turn. But um, thank you so very much. This was incredibly uh, educational and inspiring. And I feel, and I'm sure Sarah feels as well, like we have a ton of um, not only follow-up questions, but uh, I think um, solution-based, actionable steps that we can take to maybe bringing some of this to our collective audience yeah. further. So thank you. Um, this oh, was really wonderful.